goth and alternative. Those are not exactly the first words that come to mind when you think about Canadian supermodel Yasmin Gori. However, that's just what she was as a teen attending high school in Montreal, Canada. Yasmin Gori was born to a German mother and a Pakistani father. Her parents moved to Montreal from Germany to start a new life shortly before she was born. Gori grew up in a middle-class Muslim household in the west end of Montreal. Her father, Moyne, was an imam at the then-known Islamic community of Quebec, also known as the ICQ, which was Montreal's main mosque. Gori has spoken about how challenging her childhood and teen years were growing up in Montreal, not as a result of her Muslim faith, but bullied often about her skin tone and South Asian heritage. She was often called Paki and received other racist remarks hurled at her about her cafe au lait skin tone. According to Gori, quote, they used to call me Paki and they used to call me skinny and ugly and the whole thing. A lot of it had to do with my skin color, end quote. In her earlier days in interviews, Gori would still reference herself as an ugly duckling. As a result of the constant childhood bullying, Yasmin turned inwards. In those years of her life, she described herself as a rebel who always dressed in black from head to toe, black baggy pants, weird hairdos, and the black lips and black fingernails to match. The bullying resulted in her becoming a loner. Gori said her dark and alternative style was a direct re reaction to being treated as different, saying, I was always the odd one out, so this was my way of answering back. She withdrew into herself and for a short time staunchly practiced her Muslim faith. Her mother once remarked, quote, she was always very mature for her age. She liked older people and never got along with younger kids, end quote, during her adolescence. Although the narrative of how Gori was discovered working at a McDonald's at the age of 17 in 1989 is prevalent. She was actually discovered by an executive at a local high-end hair salon who had connections into the Montreal fashion scene. And this was during the time which Gori was working at a McDonald's. It was Edward Zacharia, hairdresser and artistic director of Montreal's Tatine Coiffeur, at the time, who would set the domino effects that would change Gori's life forever. It was a fateful summer day in July 1989 that Zachariah spotted the lanky and striking teen out of the salon window as she walked by, and he invited her in for a makeover. Gori recalled, quote, I went over there and I talked to them, and it sounded very interesting, so I started, end quote. Joseph Del Torto, the owner of Patin Coiffeur said her hair was a mess when Gori obliged Zacharias ask to come into the salon and sit in his chair. Del Torto also went on to say, quote, she was a great natural beauty. We knew right away that she would do very well, end quote. Zachariah took it upon himself to arrange a number of studio sessions to build her photos. One of those sessions included photographs of Gori, topless with her arms covering her bare chest, standing at the corner of Montreal's St. Lawrence Boulevard. When Gori's father got wind of the existence of these photos and Yasmin's experimentation with modeling, he was deeply disturbed and upset and found the whole ordeal offensive. Gori's parents had already been divorced by this time. Moin Gori said to his daughter, Quote, I am Muslim and modeling is not something that we allow. But then he added, quote, but it was her decision and she will have to live with the consequences. Gori once told reporters, I never thought I would be a model. It wasn't something I ever wanted to do because I was always very shy. I didn't like cameras. I still don't actually. A month and a half later, after Zachariah spotted Gori from the window of the hair salon, he was introducing her to Giovanni Bernardi, the owner 
of Giovanni in model management in Montreal. Bernardi was able to find Gori work in small local shows in Montreal, but it wasn't until he introduced the teenage Gori to agencies in New York, namely Next Model Management, when her career really took off. Despite having limited modeling experience, barely six months under her belt, Gori became a sensation in Europe. Bernardi remarked, it was only a matter of time before she was a major star. Yasmin was dissatisfied that she didn't receive the same level of attention when she first began in Canada, despite her relatively early success abroad. The Canadian fashion scene, she remembered, had been slow to receive her. Quote, I worked for six months in Canada and did nothing, basically, as she stated. Going on to say, quote, they were very slow to get the ethnic side. She acknowledged that despite her pride in being Canadian, she was, quote, very bitter in general about the Canadian response, end quote, due to her early experiences and what she perceived as a lack of support in her own home country. Even with the limited experience, Gori was getting noticed and booked not just for her striking features, but also her walk. A walk that would eventually become her signature. Her walk became so famous that even to this day, the only other person really known for a walk that is as memorable is Naomi Campbell. Bernardi added, when she turns at the end of the runway, she puts her foot down heel first like she's making a statement. It is a sign of extreme confidence. By the time Gori was 20, she already owned a home in Manhattan and was well on her way to becoming a multimillionaire, earning anywhere between 5,000 to 12,000 US for a few hours of work. At one point, Valentino called Gori the model of 1992. When the European market got their eyes on her, her career took off like nothing else in her first few years of modeling. By the end of 1990, just a year after being discovered walking by a hair salon, Gori had appeared on the cover of French Elle in July and December, landed her first major cover with Elle magazine in January 1991, soon after became the face of both Chanel and Jill Sander. In September 91, she graced the catwalk for Gianni Versace's show in Milan, and by the next month, she was walking for Chanel, Helmut Lang, Jean-Paul Gaultier, and Lanvin in Paris. Then, she became the face of Christian Dior and Anne Klein. In January 92, she was photographed by Stephen Meisel for the April 92 cover of Vogue Italia, and toward the end of the year, she appeared in British and Italian Vogue editorials. Photog Patrick de Marchelier, who photographed her for the Italian editorial issue, called her his favorite subject. Still, in 92, she landed a contract with Victoria's Secret, became the face of Valentino, Couture, and Versace. Gori even walked the controversial Johnny Versace bondage show in Milan in February 92. She became the face of Hermès and Lanvin in 93 and was photographed by Gilbert Simon for Elle. She appeared in the 95 documentary Unzipped by Isaac Mizrahi. She walked the 96th annual Victoria's Secret fashion show, becoming one of the first spokeswomen for Victoria's Secret. While she was effortlessly collecting career milestones at an early start, Gori was also opening doors and trailblazing for Asian models. Gori stepping into the high fashion scene became the catalyst for what would be referred to as the Canadian invasion, and her success got agencies large and small to search far and wide for models of Asian descent, something that wasn't as much of a priority before Gori. One agency scout told reporters, quote, we have been looking so long for the right Asian model, it's ridiculous. If there's one Yasmin Gori out there, there must be others, end quote. Gori's entrance broke the mold of the trend of the blonde-haired Nordic look that had become extremely popular and helped usher in a new era for exotic and dramatic-looking models. Gori was the first South Asian woman to land a luxury beauty contract 
the first South Asian woman to become a Victoria's Secret angel, and the first South Asian woman to grace the cover of Vogue. In an interview with the Washington Post, Susie Menkes, the fashion editor of the International Herald Tribune, admiringly said, Oh, Yasmin? From the moment she stepped on the stage in Europe, she was perfect, so poised, she's the Dalma of the future, Menkes said, referring to the legendary Brazilian model Dalma Colado, and then went on to say, quote, and you know, she's the only Asian supermodel, really, she's just fantastic, end quote. At a time when many makeup artists at the shows and photo shoots didn't have the proper skills to do the makeup of women of color, Gori would do her own makeup for virtually all of her jobs, and she did so extremely well, even becoming known for not letting anyone touch her face. Yasmin's walk became her trademark, and Karl Lagerfeld called it, quote, a new style of walking on the runway that many after her would try to imitate. Some even described her walk as a strut and a sway that practically leaves a trail of flames in its wake. The New York Times even quoted as saying, quote, coffee-skinned Yasmin Gori, whose heart to get gaze was belied by the ball-bearing swivel of her hips. ...by the name of Yasmin Gori. Now, people that know fashion in the 90s, Yasmin had the walk of life. When she would walk, it was almost like her hips would dislocate. dislocate. It was like, oh, uh, uh, uh. it was just this weird thing. And then later, she was a Victoria's Secret model. And Yasmin would not let any makeup artist touch her face. She beat what we call beat her own face and was amazing. But what I learned, and I never gave her credit, I'm giving you credit right now, Yasmin, wherever you are. I learned how to do my makeup and how to find the light. No matter what fashion show we were at, we could have been in some dungeon, some alley, some back thing, or in the or at the uh, the Louvre in Paris doing fashion shows. She found the light, and if the light were overhead and only up there, this is Yasmin doing her face. And that is not an exaggeration. I saw her do it many times. Um, I just feel the music. That's how I want to walk. If I don't walk like that, I don't feel natural. That's how I, it's like dancing for me. When I, when I first started um, doing runway, I tried to walk the way people told me to walk, and I never felt comfortable. And then one day, I just tried it, and it felt very comfortable, and I've been doing the same thing ever since. And that's the way I like to do it. She eventually became known only as Yasmin. Even at the height of her fame, Gori thought the title supermodel was absurd and rejected it as a meaningless moniker, going on to say, When people say, what is it like to be a top model or a supermodel, I just think it's such a stupid label. It's like saying, what does it feel like to be a top businessman or a super businessman? And in another interview saying, there are thousands of girls out there who could be doing my job, and I was at the right place at the right time. Ridiculous or not, by the time Gori was becoming a fixture in Milan and Paris, her father softened on his stance of his daughter being a model. Yasmin later telling reporters, Now it's fine. I think he's proud of me now, and he's gotten over that. He saw that I could achieve something. Now here's the thing, Yasmin. Go. We're gonna give you a bra and a panty because in the show, hopefully. Well, if you don't want, you don't have to. But you have to cut the thing. You have to cut that ribbon. Um, in the show, hopefully, there's like a scrim, and you can see through where the girls are changing. If you want, you know, when you go to the ballet or something, and you see like a backdrop that all of a sudden you see through. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. That's what it's gonna be. I hope. It's not going to be. See us in bras and underwear. Maybe, if you don't mind, because some of the girls don't care, and they're going to do it, and they don't care. Well, but if you, I, I if, if you care, care, all yeah. right, that's fine. I'm fed so up. she's she cares. I care. I care. So she won't. She'll be like in we the back care. somewhere. Robert, are you keeping a list of girls who don't? Barely eight years, she was active as a model. She accomplished a lot, including appearances in campaigns for Anne Klein, Bruno Magli, Chanel, 
Christian Dior Haute Couture, Escada, Etienne Agnès, Jean-Franco Ferré, Gianni Versace Couture, Givenchy Organza Perfume, Hermès, Jill Sander, Laura Baggiotti, Saks Fifth Avenue, Sports Illustrated, Sonia Reichel, Valentino, and Victoria's Secret. Walking for Chanel, Bajli Mishka, Christine Dior, Dirk Bickenberg, Driss Ben Noten, Givenchy, Jean-Paul Gaultier, John Galliano, Versace, Vivian Westwood, Antonio Berardi, and many, many others. It has been reported often about a rumor where designers would strategize to dress gory in their most expensive outfits for the runway shows because every time gory wore and modeled them, the items would sell out. Off-duty, Yasmin prioritized being very low-key. In interviews, she often mentioned wearing sunglasses and wearing types of clothing that would distract from her figure. She did so to avoid attention while in public, enjoying rather to golf, paint, rollerblade, and ski instead, compared to her, her peers who would often be rather basking in the limelight of the paparazzi. When Gory abruptly dropped out of the 96th Yves Saint Laurent show, which was out of character for her, rumors about her leaving the fashion industry started to circulate. Later, the public would learn that she got married, had a baby, and would pursue a business degree. Then shortly after, she would formally retire in 97 and faded out at the very heights of her fame, but she was never forgotten. Gory was, in fact, the inspiration of a character, Jasmine Rashad, in a comic book where the character was an expert magician in the Italian comic book series, Jonathan Steele, published by Sergio Bonelli Editore, that ran from 1999 to 2004. During the flurry of her now storied career and supermodel status, Yasmin Gori once stated, I don't fear fame, I value my life and freedom.